Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Missouri Valley Conference, welcome back to the Brian Burwell Memorial Interview Room in the Scott Trade Center for today's Between Rounds interviews featuring the four winning schools from Friday's first round action. Today's sessions are 40 minutes long per school, equally divided between the student athletes and the head coach. The same housekeeping guidelines are in force. Please silence your cell phones, please and thank you. Each time we introduce a new dais, please identify yourself and your affiliation the first time you ask a question to the head coach or to student athletes. Please wait for one of our two mic holders, Dawn and Karen, uh, before you ask a question so everybody can hear it to get them in the rotation, get their attention or mine. If you have a follow-up question, let them know before they leave your side. No flash photography allowed, nor videotaping of any kind, including cell phones. And uh, everything is being transcribed by ASAP Sports to my right and your left. First up are the Syracuse Orange, Trevor Cooney and Michael Benege. We'll follow that with the head coach, Jim Beheim. And we'll go right to questions, starting here and here. Thank you. Michael, uh, Aldo Amato, Daily News Journal, Murfreesboro. I guess not many people knew about Middle Tennessee heading into this tournament. You know, you've only had a few hours to digest what type of team they are. What sticks out to you on, when you watch the film and on paper about the Blue Raiders? Uh, they, got a, they got a lot of capable scorers. Um, they got a guy in the high post who can shoot. Uh, I actually knew a little bit about Raymond, uh, their point guard before here. He's an NC State transfer, and um, you know they got some capable guys that are going to get after it and uh, throw multiple defenses at us. And uh, we just got to be prepared. Um, you know, we were in the locker room right when you guys, I guess, saw the scores 15 to two early on yesterday. Where were you watching the end of this game, and what was kind of the reaction when you saw, you know, Middle Tennessee had, you know, Trevor, this crazy upset? Yeah, Top to both players, yeah, please. Trevor first, then Michael. Uh, we watched it the rest of the game in, in our hotel. Uh, we went back, relaxed, and watched it the second half. They're a really good team. I was really impressed with how they played. Yeah, same thing. Back here, thank you. Uh, Trevor, uh, you know, the, one of the things that stuck out yesterday was that they switch a lot. They switched all five players early. Is that something Coach Beheim has, has hit on in these few hours after the game? Yeah, we went over that today. I mean, uh, from watching the game, we saw that, and uh, we went over that, and, and hopefully we can take advantage of that. Right-hand side, gentlemen. How are you doing? George Willis, uh, New York Post. Uh, when Jim was out for those nine games, um, how did you guys uh, address that, and what was his uh, demeanor when he returned? Michael first this time. Uh, as soon as coach was able to talk to us again and, uh, you know, practice with us the following day after the Clemson game, we got after it. It was a lot of energy. Uh, we felt like we had to pick things up. And uh, we just learned from that that, um, you know, we got to compete every night, basically. And uh, coach gives us that fire and that edge to us. And um, having them back has been very uh, positive for us. Trevor, same question, the absence of your head uh, coach. Yeah, no, it was tough. It was really tough. I mean, um, for all of us, we couldn't base it off of something that we've had happen before because it's never happened before. So it was really tough. Um, but I mean, we got through it, and I, I think we became a stronger team because of it. Right here in the corner, Jim. Jim Thomas, St. Louis Post Dispatch. Trevor, you mentioned the other day that I guess during the selection show before you you were you're thinking, boy, maybe maybe we'll just get a playing game. Well. Now, how do you feel you're on the verge of getting to the Sweet 16? How exciting is that for you? Uh, it feels really good. I mean, uh, with the NCAA tournament, I mean, you got to come ready to play. And, uh, I mean, if you come ready to play, you're going to advance and you're going to beat the team. But, I mean, who's ever, who's ever ready to play is, is going to move on, and, and hopefully we can do that tomorrow. Uh, for, for both of you guys, just kind of a related follow-up question. After, after everything the program has been through in the last month, uh, 
being in the tournament, do you feel like it's, uh, I don't know, a new lease on life, so to speak? Michael first. Uh, just getting to the tournament in general is uh, always a great feeling um, with us uh, going through the coach situation in the middle of the year and uh, having a lot of ups and downs. It's just, uh, I don't know, it's just a great feeling. I feel like uh, we did enough to get in, and now that we're in, uh, we're just having fun with it and uh, looking to win games. No, it definitely, definitely felt like new life once we got into the tournament. I mean, everyone had the same record um, going into it, and um, – I mean, we just got to relax and play, and that's what we did uh, the other day, and that's what we got to do tomorrow. Uh, for both you guys, uh, Malachi obviously came into the program with, you know, big reputation, McDonald's All-American and all that. How did he assimilate into uh, the team, and uh, how would you assess, you know, his season and, and, you know, what he can provide for you if he plays like he did yesterday? Trevor, lead us off. Uh, he fit right in from the start. I mean, he's a good kid on and off the floor. And uh, I mean, on the floor, he's, he's a good attacker. And that's what we want him to do, just be aggressive and make plays. And he did that the other day. And, and when he does that, I mean, I think it makes us a, a better offensive team when he's getting in the lane and making plays. Yeah, he's been that uh, that guy in our backcourt. He's just been very successful with us. Um, you know, he's great off the bounce, great one-on-one -on -one player. And uh, when things break down, sometimes the ball is in his hands and he's just making plays for us. Little cake, um, Mike. Yeah, it seemed like Dayton was really focusing a lot of attention defensively on on you yesterday. Just, you know, how much does it help you to have you know another wing player out there who can, you know, who can take some of that pressure off if if the defense is you know really focusing on stopping you? Oh, it's a great feeling. Um, just knowing I can depend on people like Trev, uh, Malachi, and uh, Frank when he comes in the game or when Lyon is on the perimeter. Um, I think the more versatile we have on the court, uh, we're just a better team that way. Right here, second row. You know, going toward after the game until, until now, I guess, what's kind of the timeline of preparation <coughs> you guys kind of do for Middle Tennessee? And when did you kind of really start looking at their tape and, I guess, start preparing for uh, tomorrow? Michael, then Trevor, thank you. Uh, preparation started as soon as we realized they won. Um, that's when I started. Uh, personally just going over the scouting report uh, trying to remember things I watched from the game and um, you know we had practice today we walked through some things and uh, we're going to watch some film later on yeah I mean it started right after the game was over I mean I started looking at them started looking at their schedule and who they played and, and those games and then uh, we went over them today during practice read the scouting report and then we'll watch some film tonight and tomorrow Michael, uh, you know, as soon as you started looking at tape and looking at a few things about them, uh, who, who on that team? Everybody knows about Giddy Potts leading the nation in three-point shooting. Who on that team uh, really stuck out to you on tape early? It was uh, Buford with all his energy. Um, he's a guy that uh, I think we can match match up pretty well as long as we bring energy to the table. Uh, he's definitely going to come out ready to compete, and uh, we have to try to match his intensity. Yeah, two on this side, Jim, and then back there of the post. Well, a little off topic, when you guys are in a gym that you're not familiar with, what's the process like? I don't know, in terms of when you're sh shooting, getting used to the gym, uh, the, the rim's soft, are they hard, the depth perception? Just what's that like for you guys? Trevor, first, please. Um, it's a little different. Um, I mean, playing in a venue like this, it's bigger than some of the gyms we play in, in the ACC, but, I mean, it's pretty close. Um, but, I mean, we're used to it. Uh, we play a lot of road games. Um, I think playing in things like uh, the Bahamas help you get ready for things like this. Uh, I mean, down there it was three days in a row, and you got to get used to that gym down there. Uh, so I think throughout the whole entire year, it helps you prepare for uh, this moment. Yeah, to follow up on what he said, uh, we have shoot arounds, practices, and uh, once you get enough shots up in the gym, really you can get a feel for things and um, start to feel comfortable out there. Uh, Coach has been around a long time. He's quite a bit older than you guys. How does he connect with you um, off the court? Not so much as coach, but somebody who you can have a good time with. Michael, first, please. I think he connects with us from a competitive standpoint. Uh, we want to win as players, and uh, no one wants to win more than him, obviously. And we just uh, we just follow his lead. He tells us uh, what to do on the court, puts us in the right uh, spots. And off the court, uh, 
he trusts us as men to make sure we take care of ourselves, uh, do the extra work we need, and, um, you know, it's just a good fit for us. Absolutely. Big bag off of that. I mean, he's, he's a great guy, and he's great to talk to. I mean, he's a great basketball mind, and, and after the game was over yesterday, we were talking about just other games in the tournament and, uh, and his thoughts and, and just pick his brain a little bit. We are halfway through the session. Next question is on the right. For both of you, just what, can you, what you can say about the balance between the true freshmen as well as yourself as veterans and what you can say about the makeup of this team and how you've kind of balanced out and helped each other out this season. Trevor, first, please. Uh, I think our balance was there uh, the other day. And I think when we're offensively at our best is when we have that balance. I mean, in, down the Bahamas in a couple games in the ACC, we've, we've had scoring from almost everyone. And I think that's when we have our best. We're able to, to get in the lane and make plays for each other and find the open person. And uh, we had that the other day, and, and we just got to continue that and have it tomorrow, too. Yeah, I agree with what he said. Um, you mentioned uh, seniors, freshmen. Uh, I think everybody's playing at their best right now. Obviously, we can do better. But um, you know, us being senior captains, we try to make the right decisions on the court. Uh, the ball's in our hands most of the time. But we have uh, freshmen stepping up. I think Tyler Roberson's evolved as a player. Um, should be good going into his senior year. So uh, we got a lot of, a lot of depth, and um, just looking forward to winning games. Down here on the left, gentlemen. Mikey kind of touched on it, but with Tyler Roberson, <coughs> what have you seen from him this year in terms of how he's developed uh, overall in his game? Uh, he he added some dimension to his offense. Uh, he can now score. Uh, he's capable of hitting the mid range jump shot. He runs the break and. Um, Yesterday in the game, uh, he actually dribbled up the court a little bit. So uh, that was something I didn't expect. But he just, uh, he's a hard worker. He looks to improve on his game, and uh, he's gotten better because of it. <coughs> Anything else for the student athletes of Syracuse? Yes, on the right. After people saying you didn't belong in the tournament, do you feel sort of like you're a favorite now? or? What's your approach to that? Trevor? Uh, we, didn't, we didn't listen to those people. I know Coach said that yesterday, and we really didn't. Uh, we knew that we belonged in the tournament, and uh, I think we went out there the other day and proved it, and uh, we just got to continue to do that. Same. Anything else for these gentlemen? OK, we'll dismiss them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck in the game tomorrow. Coach Jim Beheim will be up next at 155 sharp. Thank you.
right on schedule head coach of Syracuse, Jim Beheim, is with us. We're going to ask him to open up with a statement about getting into the second round, maybe his thoughts on the tournament, and then we'll go to questions. Jim? Well, I am tremendously pleased the way we played the, the second half. Uh, we did a tremendous job on the boards, which has been obviously has been a weakness of ours this year. I thought that was a obviously that was a huge uh, key in terms of winning the game and uh, you know I, I just thought uh, uh, offensively we settled down the second half and, and got some good looks. Dayton's a very good basketball team. They've had a good year, a really good year. And they played in a very, very tough conference, and they they they, they won it. So it was a, a really good win, and we're we're thrilled to move on. Right here, Jim Thomas, St. Louis Post Dispatch. Coach, what are some of the uh, challenges with playing not only a team that you're relatively unfamiliar with, but also with a sharp turnaround? Well, we know them. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter their name or not. We we know as much about them as we would know about any team in the country. You know, we we've, we've seen. 10, 15 different game tapes on them prior to this. We had, we had already had one assistant looking at those and breaking those down. So we had their entire season, especially their zone offensive work, which is what we're concerned about, uh, on tape uh, before last night. So we, we're as familiar with them as we are with any team we'll play in terms of what they do. Um, obviously, watching them in person, uh, I, th I think the biggest thing was you were just impressed with the talent level of their players. Uh, I think Michigan State's a great team. I think they played a tremendous game offensively yesterday. I, I, I've seen Michigan State a few times this year. I thought they were sharp on offense. I thought they shot the ball well. Costello was you know, 9 for 10 in the post. I, I thought offensively they played a great game. But uh, Middle Tennessee, every time Michigan answered, and they answered about five different times during the game, where it was at eight, down to two, back to eight, down to four, back to eight. They answered every single time. And that's, uh, that's not easy to do against a team like Michigan State. Uh, I, I just thought they played a, a, a fabulous game. Uh, uh, it was as well played game as I watched all the games the last two days, and it was as well played a game as I, I've seen in the tournament. And, you know, when you came away from the game, there was no doubt that you felt on that particular game uh, the best team won. It was from beginning to end, they played the best. On your right-hand side, Jim. Jim, 18 rebounds coming from Tyler Roberson. Just what you can say about how he can be a difference maker in some of those big games he's had this year, especially when you needed him most. Well, we need him to do that. Obviously, that's why I was so disappointed in him at a couple different stages of this season. And, uh, in, 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 it's why, and he knows this. He, that's why what I said was, was right, and he deserved it because he's letting himself down and the team down when he doesn't play like that. I mean, it, I mean he, he's not going to get 18 rebounds every game, but he can't get two. Or four, we you know we're not going to be successful uh, with that. I mean, we don't expect him to get 18. It just things went that way, but we need him to be active and to be effective on defense, on offense, and especially rebounding the basketball. And uh, that's why you know there's cause for me uh, to have to get some message through to him. And uh, we need him to perform at that level. I love the kid, but we need him to perform at that level. And when he doesn't, it makes it hard for us to win. Left-hand side, Jim. <coughs> Coach Mark Tracy from the New York Times. Uh, with all due respect to them, I think it's safe to say most people did not see Middle Tennessee State advancing past yesterday's game. All credit to them, they did, and they fully deserved it. I wanted to go back. You mentioned you had an assistant looking at Middle Tennessee State even before that game. I was wondering if you could take me through the process. You know, you get your bid, you see that Michigan State is playing in the game that dictates your next opponent, but you still put an assistant on Middle Tennessee State. Yeah, I put an assistant on Michigan State and on, on uh, you know, on Middle Tennessee. Um, Adrian Autry was responsible for them. Jerry McNamara was responsible for Michigan State. I didn't even think about the game, to be honest with you. I didn't think about it the whole week. I didn't even 
give it a thought. Uh, you know, I'd obviously have seen Michigan State, so I knew, you know, what they were, but I didn't think about it until the end of the game. <laughs> you know, I watched the game, so that was, but those games don't help us that much because it just doesn't help us. Um, uh, scouting, we don't look at most games people play. We only look at certain games, um, and we only need to know certain things. So, uh, but but I guess to get to your what your question is, uh, we we come in and both guys prepare like we're going to play that team up until the game's over, and then we all focus on what Middle Tennessee does. But it was clear to me I had talked to a pro scout, and he had told me and some people had told him that this was a very, very good team. And uh, when you watch them play, it's pretty obvious that they're a very, very good team. Uh, my assistant told me the one, one stretch, and I, I'm not positive on this, but I think that they lost three out of four games when the shooter didn't play. You know, when he didn't play, I think they lost three games. And it'd be like if Mike didn't play for us, we'd lose three out of four. Well, we'd probably lose all four. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that they're, they're a very good team. I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, every, if they were bad, I'd be saying that too. <laughs> or if they were lucky yesterday, I'd be saying the same thing. But the truth is that they're a really, really good offensive team. I didn't see any weaknesses on that team. They didn't turn it over. They made good plays when they had to. They made shots when they had to. And they did it multiple times. Michigan State came at them multiple times. It wasn't like they were ahead the whole game and Michigan State made a little run. And they answered five or six times. And a uh, different guy, different guy answered almost every time. You know, it was, uh, it was really a great game to watch. I wouldn't have liked to have been coaching against them, but it was a, it was a great game to watch. I've, I've, all the games I've watched in the tournament, and I've watched every one you can watch, that was the best game. You know. On the right-hand side, standing. You know, you, you said you watched Michigan State ten times, day and eight times. I'm curious if at all this season you've seen Middle Tennessee and what you kind of know about their program and <coughs> Kermit and all, you know, just about it. I, <coughs> I didn't watch Middle Tennessee this year. They weren't on television. It's hard to watch somebody. I'm not going down there. But uh, I watched them enough yesterday and in tapes last night to know as much about them as I need to know. I, mean, I know too much about them, in fact. Jim, Dan Wolk in USA Today. Um, Malachi Richardson committed to you really early. Uh, what did you like about him, you know, it, that young, and, and what's impressed you about him this season? Well, the good players do recruit, do commit early usually, and uh, he was, a, you know, a shooter. You know, I mean, that was the thing. He could shoot the ball. Uh, he always just shot the ball. It's like his mother says, it's Malachi can shoot the ball. If he was as tough as his mother, he'd really be good. But that's another story. But, uh, you know, he always could score. Um, his weakness always was, you know, uh, really putting the ball on the floor. And that's the one thing he's worked at on this year with, with Jerry, uh, you know, is the ability to put the ball on the floor and make plays. And that's where he's made a big growth jump. And next year he'll – be playing guard all the time, not small forward, and he'll he'll have an opportunity to even get better. But he's a, a big time shooter. He uh, he's a lot of confidence in, his, in himself on offense, and uh, he's uh, he was he's been good right from the jump, right from the first game. He's been probably you could say our most consistent player shooter uh, this year. I think the two freshmen have been uh, tremendously consistent. Uh, Tyler Lydon and, and Malachi Tyler Lydon the last 12, 14 games, probably averaged 14 points a game. He, once he got over the fact that he's supposed to shoot, he, we want him to shoot, uh, you know, he uh, he's the, the two freshmen have played great for us this year. I mean, that's, there's no question about that. They've been been tremendous. Standing up on the right, Jim. Matt Schneiman from the Daily Orange. Jim, do you remember a team this year that threw as many defenses at you as Middle Tennessee did against Michigan State yesterday? Uh, you know, they play a couple different combination zones and uh, in a very good man-to-man. -man. They switch a lot and they hedge. They, they do different things in their defense. But, uh, you know, we'll see some. We see some of that in the league. But not. Uh, there's, not a, there's not as many teams. And teams haven't 
really played us much zone this year. We've seen a little bit, but we practice against a pretty good zone every day. So I think we'll be prepared for that. Here in the middle. Matt Park from uh, Syracuse IMG. Coach, if I did the math properly, this is the 100th NCAA tournament game in the history of the program, and you've been around for almost all of those. Do you have a, it's Middle Tennessee's 11th. Do you have a reflection on what it was like back then when this wasn't routine? Well, you know, I mean, the tournament in the beginning was completely different. It was a different animal. It, uh, going back to when I played, nobody even, I don't think half the people in Syracuse didn't know we were in the tournament until we got to the regional finals. So it was just a different world. And then even early in coaching, um, you know, it just was it just, just was different. And uh, the tournament has become the, unfortunately, become the season, you know, for – especially the good teams. If you're a top 20 team, you think you should get to the Final Four. And in fact, top 30 or something. Coaches are getting fired every day now because they don't get their team to the you know, Sweet 16 or something. I mean, it's, uh, everything hinges on, uh, you know, especially the good teams, hinges on what you do in the tournament. And it, there's, it's just the way, it's the reality. I mean, there's nothing we're gonna do to change it. Um, I don't think it's right. Uh, but it's the way it is because you get in a tournament and now more than ever that you can be a really good team, have a great season, and you run into a hot team and you're, 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 you're going home. I mean, uh, I think 13 out of 24 or 11 out of 24 were upsets, I guess, so-called upsets yesterday or lower, the worst team won, the supposedly worst team won. Um, it's so even now that when you get in, it just, you know, two years ago we had a really good team. We played great the whole year. Won, I think we won 25 straight games maybe, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but we did lose to Boston College, so obviously we could lose. Uh, we played a very good Dayton team. We went 0 for 12 from the three. And we made one shot outside of the layup in the game. We lost by two points, and you think it was the end of the world. It's just the way it is. It's, it's just the way college basketball is. And not to take anything away from Dayton, they're a very good team. But when you miss shots, it's hard to win in this tournament. Very hard. We have eight minutes to go in this session. Two questions are up. Go. Joe Rex, Joe Detroit Free Press. Jim, you mentioned Middle Tennessee's zone offense, which obviously you didn't get to see yesterday. But what, from what you have seen, how yeah. do they match up well, with what they, you do? They played against a lot of zone this year. A lot of teams own them for good reason. They're, <laughs> they're hard to guard, uh, but they're good against the zone. You know, that, that's the one point I would make. There's a lot of times you'll see a team that's really good against a man-to-man. -man. They drive a lot, and that's what they can do. Uh, and then they're not good against the zone. This team's very good against the zone. They pass the ball well. They the multiple shooters. Uh, they, they rebound it well. Uh, they've got good post players offensively. So this is a difficult team. If I played both defenses, I'd be it'd be a toss up which one I would play. Luckily, I don't have to make those decisions. Back in the right, Greg Mullen, ESPN coach. Back in 1991, you went through something that Coach Izzo went through yesterday. Yeah, we were the first one. <laughs> we lost to a, a good Richmond team in uh, Washington D.C. And they, you know, they had the, the building, obviously, the fans. Um, we hadn't been playing great at the end of the year. We had a lot of issues. And uh, we just didn't, didn't play very well. And, uh, you know, it's a, not a good feeling. But um, it's, it's, uh, there's not much you can say about it. It's, it's very difficult when you lose that game. What would you tell Coach Izzo? Because he looked like... He'd been run over by a bus yesterday. Well, I, you know, he, he Tom is a good friend of mine. I, I'm proud to say that. He's one of the best coaches I've ever seen or coached against, and uh, not just tournament. He's just a, he's just a great coach. Um, but, you know, and he's been un incredible in the tournament. He he's avoids – he usually finds a way to win uh, even when he's in a tough game like that. Uh, but that team just played – they just played great. I mean, they, Michigan State came back at them time and time again. And there's not much you can say. I mean, it's, it's, you live with that loss for a long time. Um, 
that's what you do when you when you lose in this tournament. We've I've lost more than a few uh, games, but I finally realized that everybody loses in this tournament. Every coach, every team, every program, somewhere along the line, uh, you're going to lose to in one of those games, and um, it, it, it's not easy. But it's not easy when you lose when you're an underdog either, you know, in, in this tournament because, you know, you're done. So it's, it's very difficult. Right here, center. Coach Aldo Amato of the Daily News Journal. Uh, was there a particular player that stuck out to you on tape yesterday for Middle Tennessee? I know Giddy Potts is mentioned. and Well, the uh, shooters always, you know, for us, it's always the shooters, you know, that we worry about. And uh, he's as good a shooter as I've seen. I mean, I, I watch him shoot. You, you, you really think it's a mistake if he misses. I mean, you know, something happened because he's, he, you know, even the tough shots he takes are almost go in. Uh, yeah, you, I think about him, but you know they're they're all they don't have a spot that's like a weak spot because to me I look at teams and we try to look for a weak offensive spot that our zone can not worry about too much. They can score at all five positions. I, the the five guys on that team can score 20 points. They they probably have. I don't have to even look at, it, but they, they can. They they're all capable of scoring 20, 25 points. And those are the teams that, uh, from a defensive, whatever defense you play, those are the teams you always worry about. I used to talk to Al, Coach Al McGuire all the time. He says, well, we just try to find one guy that can't play. We don't guard him, and we guard the other four with five. But uh, they don't have that. They, they, they've got everybody that can score. Down here, we're under five minutes to go. Jim? Coach, just any any thoughts in general why there's so many quote unquote upsets this year? Yeah, there's just so I've said this for a while. There's so many good players. You know, my sons play AU basketball, so you know I go to all these <laughs> all summer. All I do is go to AU basketball games, and I've been going. You know, they're younger. They were younger, and so I just go in seven, when they were in seventh and eighth and ninth and tenth grade, all that, and see all these kids playing. The, you know, all over the country we would travel, and there's just so many good players. And then when, you know, when we go out recruiting, you know, it's not unusual. I walked into a gym last year, and I saw this guy. I said, oh, who's this guy? Who's recruiting him? And they said, well, not many, not many schools. I said, well, he's good enough to play for Syracuse, <laughs> you know? And he wasn't like he was an unknown player. Uh, you know, he ended up, got recruited, and he'll be, a, he'll be an all-league player where he's going. But... Um, there's just a lot of guys that can play, and uh, you know it doesn't matter what league you're in or who you are. The, the you know the top schools they're going to get their players. It's going to they're going to get good players, but there's a lot of other guys that are going to go and get together, and, and especially when they stay f four years. You know if you really in recruiting, if you didn't get any of the top say 50 players, 75 players, but you got 10 guys in the next group and they all stayed four years, you'd probably be better off. <laughs> I mean, we're not smart enough to do that, but you know, that you'd, you'd almost be able to have a better, pro more consistent program if you did that. And they all, you know, problem is we took a couple guys who were 50, 60 and they both left after one year. <laughs> 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 they were too good. They got too good too fast, but, um, you know, one and two years. But there's just a lot of good players, and that's good for college basketball. It's bad for coaches because it all looks like such an upset uh, when you lose. And, the, you know, the coach is always going to get the blame, and that's just, you know, just the way it is, and it's it's okay. But I watched Yale play the other day. They, they didn't look like an upset to me. They played great. I watched, you know, obviously the game here, but – Watching the last couple of days, some of these teams, they're, they're just really, really good teams out there. And there's going to be a lot of those games, a lot of those so-called upsets, I guess. But it's good player. There's a lot of good players. And there's a lot of good coaches. There's a lot of good coaches, really good coaches, I think. And we are out of time. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Middle Tennessee will be next at 2.20.
2020 session features the Middle Tennessee State Blue Raiders. They have a date tomorrow with the Syracuse Orange. Jaquan Raymond, Reggie Upshaw, Perrin Buford will represent the student body here, and we will go right to questions. Two on the aisle and then one in the front row, Karen. Joe Rexroad, Detroit Free Press. For all of you guys, can you put into words what making the Sweet 16 would mean to you, to this team, to this program? Start with Jaquan, and then we'll go to Reggie and Perrin. Um, it'll mean a lot to me personally because it'll be a great way to end my senior year to go to the Sweet 16. It's always been a dream of mine to go to the Sweet 16. As for the program, I think it'll be the first Sweet 16 we've went to, so it'll be a, it'll be a big key to win this game for the program. Um, just for myself, it'd be a, a huge accomplishment. Every kid, when you're growing up, kind of dreams of going to the NCAA tournament and making it to uh, the round of 32, the Sweet 16, the Final Four championship. So um, just to uh, say that I could possibly play in the Sweet 16 for myself, that's a huge accomplishment. And for my team, um, like Jaquan said, it's huge for our program. Uh, being a smaller, smaller uh, school, it just puts us out there on the national level. And um, for me, I just feel like uh, to make Sweet 16, it'll just make all the hard work worth it. Um, like, I'm a gym rat, and um, I just feel like um, when you put in the work, the results will come. And for this team, I just feel like we put in a lot of hard work um, starting last year, even though we struggled. But this year, it all came together. And I just feel like it'll just be a, um, a real big deal for the university. And it'll be good, like they said, put us on the national stage. Uh, Jaquan, are you are you happy that you uh, packed for Sunday? First off, and uh, second, what's been the mood in uh, the locker room over the past twenty four hours? Really, uh, just just your uh, reaction. First off, our mood in the locker room has been the same as it was. We came into the yesterday's game. We come into this game business like we come into this game as knowing we're gonna win this game. There's no pressure on us. We have nothing to lose, and we're gonna go out there and give it our all. Right here at the front. Sam Worm from the Daily Orange. Um, for, uh, for Jaquan and Perrin, um, I know that this team has a lot of guys that kind of you know, made their way to Middle Tennessee State after you know, being elsewhere. Can you just talk about, I guess, why, why you kind of picked here and what your journey was to, to get here after you know, being at different colleges? Perrin first, then Jaquan. Well, um, coming to Middle has just been bittersweet because I went to two junior colleges, um, one at Milo State um, in Lynchburg, Tennessee, then the other one at Southwest Tennessee. Um, where I played under the same coach, I just followed him, and uh, he was he was a great mentor to me, and just told me a lot, and just showed me a lot. So um, coming here was kind of um, based off a lot of different other factors, but um, I don't regret my decision at all, and it's been a, a wonderful ride, and I just enjoyed the journey. As for me, transferring from NC State was a big step. I didn't know what to expect, so with me, Coach Cal was the main reason why I transferred, and then Coach Moxley, who's at NC State now. We grew a big bond together, me and Coach Tao and Coach Mox. So that kind of got me here, you know, talking to Coach Davis. So this experience has been one of the probably the top moments of my life, and I wouldn't change it for the world. We're here on the aisle. Is that a hand back there as well? Yeah, OK. Go ahead. Uh, Reggie, what have you guys really seen um, that you guys are going to have a hard time with really going up against uh, the two three zone well just their length their size um, both like on the perimeter of their two three zone and then in the middle um, they have great rebounders I mean anytime you play a team who has a the length that they have at each position and then just um, how, how hectic they they kind of uh, play their two three zone it, uh, it always presents a challenge for your team but um, if we just continue to stay aggressive on the offensive end and then crash the offensive boards, we'll, uh, we'll have a great chance of winning this game. Back left, gentlemen. Um, two questions. Have, have you guys watched Syracuse the, the course of this season? And then at a glance, is there somewhere where you think you guys could excel in terms of the matchup? Reggie and Jaquan, in that order. Uh, I haven't really watched uh, much of uh, Syracuse play this season. Um, with the season being so long, we kind of get caught up in our own uh, conference play. But I'd say the only part, or the mo the main thing in the game that we could uh, we could probably advance or excel in, would be our offensive rebounding, defensive rebounding. Uh, anytime you can limit a team to one shot, you always have a great chance to win the game. 
I think I've seen Syracuse play about once or twice. And the key for us, like he said, would be rebounding. But also, we have five shooters that that can spray the floor. And we know we have to do – we have to get the ball on the inside, but we also can penetrate and kick to our shooters. What's it really been like for all of you guys seeing yourself on ESPN, uh, Twitter, uh, just everything? What's that been like to just see your own highlights all – all over the place. Perrin, you first, and then Reggie. Um, for me, it's just it's a blessing. I just give all um, thanks to God, um, my Savior. Um, so for me, just seeing it's just a blessing, just because I know how much work I've put in in the off season, and it's just all coming to um, to life, and just seeing it's just like unreal. Like what Perrin said, it's really just an honor. Um, anytime that you can uh, see yourself on TV, um, you see highlights of uh, your teammates doing great things on the court. And then you hear uh, other people uh, speaking so highly of you. It's, um, it's really a blessing and an honor. On the aisle. Yeah, Coach Davis talked yesterday about 100% graduation rate, I think 40 straight uh, players uh, graduating who have exhausted their, their eligibility. How demanding is he from that perspective? And how much pride is taken in, in the academic side in your program? Jaquan, you first, then Reggie. Uh, he's very big on academics, especially when we go out of town. He makes sure our academic advisor has everything lined out for us, what we need to do over the course of us missing school. So he's that's his biggest issue is academics. He don't play about that, and he takes that very serious. Yeah, um, Coach Davis is really, really strict about academics. Um, we have this thing called the point system. Anytime you're, like, late for a class or, like, you may miss a class or anything, you, uh, you get a point. And then um, if you get to like two points, you have to run in the morning. And then, I mean, I haven't seen anybody get to four points. But if you get to four points, the whole team has to run. And uh, you don't want to be that guy. So <laughs> so everybody uh, makes sure they're on, they're on time to class and they make it to class. Back left, go ahead. Um, you guys are in the national conversation now. Folks are saying how good this team is. Questions even have come up about the seating. Um, but I'm sure you all knew this. But now that all these things are swirling, does that change anything for you in terms of added pressure, added focus, or is it still just one step at a time? Perrin, lead us off, and then we'll go to Reggie and Jaquan. Um, our outlook is still the same. This team is hungry, and we're just ready um, to come out and win and just play like we've been playing all year long. I mean, we, um, we feel like we're a good team, and um, I'm glad that people are starting to recognize it, but it don't put any pressure on us at all. Um, we still have the same mindset and just want to continue to ride the streak. Yeah, there's no pressure on us. Um, I know uh, myself and my teammates, Coach Davis, when we were watching the selection show, we saw that we got a 15 seed. We were kind of, I mean, we didn't, I wouldn't say disrespected, but um, we definitely knew that we were better than a 15 seed. We were thinking like a 13 maybe. But um, as far as there being pressure, there's no pressure on us. We just have to go out and play how we know we can play. Uh, and as you saw yesterday, we can really compete with anyone in the nation. Coach Davis is very strict on tradition. And with us, we play to who we are. We don't play outside of who we're not. We're going we're gonna to guard and we're going to be tough. That's what we do. And if we do those two things, we will come out with a successful tomorrow's game. Back in the right. She'll get there. She ran 5K this morning. She Hi guys, Greg Mullen from ESPN. Um, sh can you share some of the tweets and texts that you got after the last game? Let's start with Jaquan and go that way. Um, <laughs> of course, you know our phones was buzzing nonstop since we, from the time we got out of the game to this morning probably. I mean, the tweets were, there were some mad tweets of course, and there were some good tweets, but we just took it all in and we left that in yesterday and we're moving forward to tomorrow. Yeah, Reggie, um, what about your phone? <laughs> uh, when I got to my phone after the, yesterday's game, I probably had like at least 500 notifications from all the different um, medias. So, but I mean, as far as like Twitter, I saw a couple things where they were talking about I look like kid and play. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but mostly it was just kind of like what Jaquan said. A lot of people were mad that we upset and messed everybody's brackets up. And there were a lot of people, <laughs> as far as like in Murfreesboro, everybody was congratulating us and things like that. 
Yeah, all my family um, hit me up, friends and family around um, who watched the game, who've been watching me, um, just congratulating me and things like that. And um, a couple people retweeted um, something I had said like a couple days before the tournament, and I uh, put it on there, just wait and watch and be a witness. And so they um, they retweeted that, and a lot of people was like, okay, we're a witness now and things like that. So that was pretty cool. About eight minutes to go in this session. Jim Thomas is up. I got to ask you, Giddy Potts, your teammate, he doesn't look like a basketball player. He looks like he should be playing fullback for somebody. Do you, do you guys ever kid him about that? Reggie? Um, uh, when Giddy first came uh, to MTSU on his visit, uh, he, has a, he has a younger brother that's taller than him, kind of looks like me, well, like my body type. And so uh, when, the, when the coaches kind of brought us in the weight room to, to meet him, um, they were like, yeah, man, Giddy, he's a great shooter, all that kind of stuff. And um, so I, I walked up to his younger brother thinking he was Giddy. <laughs> I was like, man, we can't wait to get you here. And he was like, no, nah, you talking about my brother. And I looked at Giddy, and at this time he was like, he was easy 240. So, uh, <laughs> so um, just seeing somebody like that out there doing the things that he does on the court um, with his body type and his size and how, how quick he can move is really amazing. Anything else for the gentleman from Middle Tennessee State? Jim, go ahead. One of the, one of the tweets I saw last night was from uh, Benny Cunningham, and NFL player from Middle Tennessee State. Do you, you guys know him at all? Is he ever around the basketball program? Whoever knows him can speak. Um, well, I know him from me being a senior. I've been at MT for four years. So me and him, we've grown close over the years. We're not as close as we used to be when he was at MT, but – I know him, and every time he comes back, we're always talking about what this team can accomplish, and, and he's the only one that really believes in us outside of ourselves. Anything else for the Blue Raiders? Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Good luck tomorrow. Kermit Davis up next at 2.40.
head coach of the Blue Raiders is here, Kermit Davis. We're going to ask him to start off with a statement uh, about getting to the second round, the tournament in general. Then we'll go to questions. Coach? Well, it was. It was, it was a great day for, for our program and uh, our city and our university yesterday. I was really proud of our players. Uh, I know they're on display, and they, they played really, really well. And you, know, you look at Michigan State's stats, and and I thought Tom's team you know, shot at 55% and scored 80 points. And uh, so our guys just kind of answered every call. What I was really proud of is kind of how they handled the win, you know, as I thought they handled it, uh, being humble and class, and they act like they had been there. And that's exactly the way we wanted it, especially against it. We were fortunate to win against a, a class program like Michigan State. But now our full attention is to Syracuse. We got that started last night in a different style, but another really, really Good team, very well coached team. Start right here, number two is on the aisle. Yeah, Kermit, uh, Dan Wolk in USA Today. Uh, when you recruited Giddy Potts, did you have any sense you were getting the, you know, maybe the best three-point shooter in the country? And is it just kind of one of those typical stories where, you know, a guy kind of gets overlooked for, you know, one physical trait or another that maybe the, the big schools didn't, you know, didn't, didn't see? You know, Dan, it was. a, a, a a guy that was an assistant coach at another university called me and he says, Kermit, and this was in the spring, you know, it's kind of like January, February, maybe February, and he said, there's this kid in Athens, Alabama, and it's real close to Murfreesboro. He said, I think he fits your team. He's got toughness, and he said, he's just as good a shooter as I've seen, and nobody's really recruiting him. And so we went down there and loved him, and, uh, and he came on the campus unofficially, he and his brother, and, and loved it. He wasn't going very far from home. He's just one of those kids, and, uh, and he is. We knew he could really, really shoot it. And uh, I don't know, though, the he, I just think he can go to any level, and he just shoots it like that with confidence, and he's got such a good physicalness about him. Joe Rexho, Detroit Free Press. Kermit, can you put into words what one more win would mean to you, your program, your university, to get to the Sweet 16? You know, I think this is that I can only imagine the great uh, publicity that we could have for a week you know, leading up to trying to go to Chicago and, and to beat another storied program like, like Syracuse. And so it mean a lot, you know, and, and I think our, our team, I, I really, I'll be shocked if we don't play well. And I don't know if that means we'll win the game, but, but I really believe that our team will play with a maturity and uh, I think they'll have the same demeanors we did yesterday. What does this mean for you and uh, the seniors, just being here, being the big, underdog and winning just what does that mean um, just for these uh, three seniors well you know Perrin and, and Darnell and Jaquan have been have been terrific and uh, their leadership has been outstanding you know college basketball college athletics is so funny and you know the twists and turns and we're right in the middle of our regular season championship and we lose a tough game to UAB and then tough game to Western Kentucky at home and Giddy Potts goes out with a concussion. He's going to be out 11 days. And so, you know, and, and our guys just rallied around. And Perrin Buford and these guys did such a marvelous job. And then now you end up here, you know. So you just got to stay the course. And, and those guys have handled that locker room in a great manner. Standing up on the right. Coach, what has Ed meant to this team? And I, uh, I was just talking to Aldonis, uh, how you sent the Kevin Ware article to them after that happened. What was that moment like? And is kind of this run in some ways an inspiration playing for Ed? I, I think it has. You know, we were the day before our Conference USA tournament. Ed was starting. Giddy was just coming back from his concussion. And it was, it, was a, it was a gruesome injury. I mean, it really was. It was the day before we played. And it was a dislocate, uh, dislocation of a fractured ankle. And it laid bad. And we'd only practiced about 30 minutes. And so I walked out of the, the gym and just kind of gathered myself. What are we going to do with this team, you know? And I walked back in the gym. The whole team just sat, the gym was just deafening silence, just sitting around Ed. And so we just, you know, we sat there and I said, guys, we're going to, Ed's going to be fine. It's going to take him a while. It's probably a six-month recovery, but he's going to play basketball. And then we kind of went back in the mode, and then we did. We pulled off the Louisville articles and, and how they rallied around Kevin Ware. And we had played against Kevin Ware this year at Georgia State. So our guys saw him healthy. And I think that was good, too. And uh, so then I think it made him feel better for Ed that he's going to recover. And then our team did a really good job because, I mean, you're talking about a guy that epitomizes student athletes. Ed Simpson does. He's a marvelous student and a really tough guy.
two, three on the aisle now. Go here first. Yeah, to go back to Giddy for a second, I think uh, I read somewhere he showed up pretty much overweight <laughs> when he came in as a freshman. Um, well, how did you guys get him, you know, in shape and 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 was there, you know, was that a, a concern for you uh, that he was, you know, so heavy? Well, we, we tried to get him to go to only one bowl of ranch with everything he eats instead of two bowls. All right, so that was that was the start. So, but uh, you know, he's just one of those guys that he just his eating habits, you know, were just poor, and uh, he had never really trained. I don't even know how much weights he ever lifted. He walked in our weight room, and he's as strong as any football guy on our campus. I mean, he's just, as we use in the South, and I'm from Mississippi, he's just country strong. He is, and he just, he's built, he's built like that. And, uh, but then Giddy started to understand his body, and then when he got down and his body fat really went down, then he saw how much better player that he is. And we're still going to work on it in the spring. And I think Giddy probably weighs about 219, 220. And I think even if he can get down to maybe seven or eight pounds less, he'll even become more athletic. Heading in to this uh, matchup on Sunday, um, what's just one thing that you see um, could really be a difficult challenge for you guys offensively? Well, you know, uh, Jim's team in the zone is, is what it is. His guards are so big and so athletic, and they do such a good job of recruiting the guards that, that fit how they're going to defend. And, uh, you know, they only give up like 30% from three. And so they, they guard the three-point line, and you can't fall in love with that and start shooting bad threes. Hopefully the interchangeable parts of our team, Reggie, Perrin, Darnell, in and out, uh, we, we got to drive the ball. You got to get paint touches against the zone, and hopefully good ball movement and different guys that can be able to penetrate the zone will help. On the aisle. Yeah, Kermit, you guys were talking earlier about academic accountability and uh, the point system you have. I guess it, Reggie said you, know, you don't want to get to four points. You don't want to be that guy. Can you, can you, <laughs> can you explain to us w w what that system is? Yeah, you know, we, we implement I have a, I have a marvelous lady, Winifred Counts, who's been at our school for, gosh, 26, 27 years. And, uh, you know, if, if you're late for a class, you're minus half a point. If you miss a class, it's a point. Uh, if there's some kind of disruption, and all I do, I'm just the enforcer of the rules, and I don't deviate at all. Now, you get positive points, too. If you make a certain grade in a, in a class or whatever, uh, test, you get positive points. If you get minus two points, uh, you run the next morning at 6.30. If you get to four, then it becomes a peer pressure deal where the whole team runs. And so that's only happened like twice in our deal. But it, but it, it keeps them accountable, and we put the points on the board, you know, and uh, I think Adonis Foote's the only guy that's got a, a point right now on our board when we left to go to, uh, to St. Louis. And it really helped, probably the article that came out in the USA Today, you know, that our men's and women's team have a 100% graduation rate right now. And the last one that was figured by the NCAA. And I think in the spring, Jaquan Raymond changed his major to computer engineering, so he'll take another year. Darnell and Perrin will graduate on time. And I think it's 41 or 42 straight players in a row that have graduated that have exhausted their eligibility. So it's, it's really, really important. And we've had junior college guys in that mix too. And I think it's 15 or 16 straight junior college guys. So. Uh, it, it's really important, like it is to every coach, but it really is for our guys, and, and they've done a great job with it. All right, we have two questions on the right-hand side. Three is over here, and then we'll go back here for four. Go. Coach Greg Mullen from ESPN. I'm wondering, going from an Izzo man-to-man to, -man to a uh, Bayheim 2-3 zone, it's such a drastic difference. How do you change your mindset and get into it? How much have you seen? How much do you take away from the Dayton success at getting to the rim? Yeah, it is. It's a totally different preparation. And you try to go back and, and, and think about some teams that we've played in zone. And there's two or three teams in our league that play zone. Now, they don't assimilate the length and the guards and the things that, that Syracuse do. Uh, we did. We just got through watching the Dayton game. And I thought early on, Dayton got a lot of paint touches and the ball moved really well. But what Syracuse does, I mean, it's just what they do. They can kind of figure out where guys are and they adjust. They do a great job at halftime as the game gets longer. Their, their guys understand where your guys are. So that's why I think you've got to have a little more unpredictability and the, the movement throughout the game and different things that you do is important against them. 
We are halfway through. Next question's here. Hey, Coach. Uh, your career had a little different path back at, back at the start when you got going. I was just wondering, as you look back on that one year at A&M, how maybe that um, affected you or maybe changed? Did it change your outlook or your approach to the coaching profession at all? You know, I was 30 years old and I got this great opportunity at Texas A&M and uh, we'd won a bunch of games at Idaho and, uh, you know, I made some mistakes there and I guess it was in 1990 and I think I'm, you don't ever wish it on anybody, but if you go through it, it probably makes you a better coach and appreciation uh, and, and it did and I, we kind of had to recycle uh, our career, and so it went back from to a junior college, back to Utah State, to Idaho, LSU, Middle Tennessee, and uh, it is. It, it teaches you a lot of things. I'm, I'm a lot better person, a lot better coach, and uh, because of that experience. On the left. Hey coach, uh, Mark Tracy from the New York Times. I understand from talking to a lot of your guys that uh, Jacob, although he, he hasn't been able to play and, and won't be able to play uh, for the remainder of this season, um, has nonetheless been kind of both an inspirational figure, but also a real contributor. I was wondering if you could just describe some of the ways that he's helped you, you know, with your team. You know, Jacob Ivory was our starting point guard, and we lost him to a concussion. And uh, so we, we, we've really fought some injuries. And, you know, after we won the Conference USA Championship, Jacob just had, he was just crying. He was just had tears in his eyes and didn't play. And uh, Early in the summer, you ask your guys, your best leader, Jacob Ivory, toughest guy, Jacob Ivory, best teammate, Jacob Ivory. And so we lost a lot in losing him. And, uh, but we've taken him on every trip. He is right in the middle of everything, warm-ups. And uh, he is. He, he's as good a person as there is. And uh, we just hope he'll get healthy. Back in the right standing. Hey, Coach Joe Dubin, WSMV Nashville. We talked to your team about continuing to play with a chip on their shoulder. Do you like that if they keep doing that? You know, I, I don't know if, you know, Joe, I, I don't know if chips on your shoulders win any games. I, I, you know, I, I really don't. I think it just comes down to playing basketball, you know, for the, for, the, for the time that you're out there. I just think that, you know, we have good players, and, and I think they believe in themselves. I think they believe in our, in our system and how we play. And uh, I don't know, I, I think if you have to play for chips on your shoulder, I, I don't think it'll last very long. And uh, I just hope that those guys will just play basketball, try to get the scout in the game, and play real confident tomorrow. Right here in front. Carmen, do you have a, any theories for why you guys are such a good three-point shooting team but have struggled this year from the foul yeah. line? And in a game like yesterday, you know, where you got to make some, you know, what are you thinking as a coach knowing, you know, knowing how big of a problem that's been? You know, Reggie, uh, Upshaw, you know, you saw he makes threes, and uh, it is like you know my golf game is real, real average, and and he he got the yips just like in putting, you know, he really did in the middle of the year, and and then he's in the last six or seven games he's done a lot better. Then he went to the line for the conference championship and just made them and shot them great. Yesterday he shot them and he's moving around, you know, free throw shooting is like putting, you know, if your head starts moving, your body starts moving the chances go down. And uh, when Reggie stays still at the line, he's a lot better free throw shooter. But you're right, Darnell Harris, who's as good a five-man three-point shooter in college basketball, and he kind of struggled. So I don't know, it was just kind of a mental thing. And, uh, but they seem to make them when it's on the line, which is a good thing. All the way back. Uh, Kermit, uh, off that earlier question about the early part of your career, how much do, do you owe for your current position to Boots Donnelly? And, what did he talk about with you when he was getting ready to hire you at middle? You know, Coach Donnelly, I tell you, uh, and some ties to Michigan State, you know, you tried, I'd gone back to be the head coach at Idaho, and uh, I have an older daughter that has special needs, and Moscow is our second time back there. Uh, my wife really needed to be in the South and kind of closer to, to her family, and, and I thought it helped. And it was a great move to go back with a good friend of mine at LSU with John Brady. And I tried to get involved with the Middle Tennessee job. I could get nowhere. I couldn't get anywhere. I couldn't get Coach Donnelly to call me back. And so this is how it all works. And so John Smith, who used to be the head football coach at Michigan State, he and I are very best friends, and he was the head coach at Louisville. And he called me, and he, he just, out of the blue, I didn't call John L. He goes, he goes, he goes Kermit, he goes, uh, he goes, would you be interested in that Middle Tennessee job? I said, yeah, I would, John L., but I can't even get the guy to call me back. He said, well, Boots Donnelly's a great friend of mine. And in five minutes, Coach Donnelly calls me. And, uh, and I meet him in Atlanta at the Final Four, and I could tell after about 10 minutes, I really thought 
you know, he and I connected, and uh, Coach was great. I mean, he reminds me of my dad. He's, my dad's a basketball coach, Coach Downey, football, old school, and uh, he was tremendous. He called me the other day after we'd won the championship, and uh, so he was great, and uh, he's, a, he's still a, a really, really good friend. On the aisle. I'm just wondering if you've ever had a back-to-back -back coaching matchup like going from Izzo to Bayheim. No, not not that caliber. I mean, not that caliber right there. I mean, you're talking about as two good a guys uh, basketball-wise has been in our profession. So that really is. That's uh, not only just the uh, tradition of their schools, but but both those guys and what they've done, national championship coaches. So it's a it's just a great opportunity for all of us to play against that caliber team. Five minutes to go. Three questions are up on the right. Coach, just what you can say about Win Case and, and how much he's meant to this team and, and just his kind of story of, of coming to you with Bill Self telling him that he should take an opportunity like that. Yeah, Win Case is, is I think he's seven or eight years. And, you know, he won two national championships as the head coach at Oklahoma City College. So Win's a really good basketball coach. I had an opening and, and, and Bill called me and he says, Kermit, he goes, he goes, you got good people skills and I've got good people skills, but I'm going to tell you a guy that is off the chart that's better than both of us combined. This guy named Wynn Case. I said, well, I've heard of Wynn, but I really don't know him. And I interviewed Wynn Case, and he was just terrific. He's got that infectious smile. He's been a great recruiter for our, uh, for our team. He, he has meant a ton over the last six years and all the winning that we've had. Hey, Coach, George Willis, New York Post. I'm just curious, how much of what happened at A&M do you share with your current players about adversity and persevering and all that? Kind of nothing, thing. nothing at all. Not with my players, you know, not, not at all. It's, it's what happened it has nothing to do with them, you know, and it happened in a 20-something uh, years ago. And like I said, it's just it's one of those things that we all grow from adversity. We've all had it in this room. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's something, like I said, that, is, that has helped me and, uh, and has helped me as a coach prepare for the opportunity now, but not at all. I've never brought it up to them. Coach, I'm, I'm assuming you learned uh, a lot about coaching from your dad. I'm just wondering how much of that do you still use, is still applicable, and do you talk to him still about Yeah, things? you know, my father's 80, and uh, he was a high school coach, and then he was, a, he was a, uh, the Army coach at Fort Dix, New Jersey, and then he went to Mississippi State as an assistant. I don't know, when I was growing up, I was there at every practice, my brother and I. Uh, I don't know about this. It's really the X's and O's. He was such a southern gentleman. He had such great people skills. And uh, he was SEC coach of the year in 1970. So I think when you're young, you, you just pull from all the things. You, you just around it all the time. And the people that I got to meet just with him, you know, was probably the biggest thing. And, uh, but I still talk to him every day. And, uh, and uh, he really is. It, it's, it's, I don't know if you could ever have a better – childhood and to grow up with a guy that's uh, coaching in the SEC and be able to travel to all those schools and do those things. Right here in front. Have you been watching any of uh, the ESPN highlights, any of that, and what are your thoughts on being this year's Cinderella? You know, I've, uh, I, I think I've seen the highlights once, you know, and uh, I, I really haven't seen too much of it. You know, you, you don't, I guess the next day is when you really kind of see it from a national perspective. And, uh, and you're just proud of, of your players. And uh, like you said, we, we talked about it a lot. I said, guys, there's going to be some great stories coming out of this tournament. And, you know, it'd be nice if it was Middle Tennessee. And we talked about it during the week. You just, you hear about these stories all the time. And uh, so it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's great when you, when you become a fabric of, of your community. And I've been there 14 years. And we're a huge part of, of everything that goes there. I mean, we, we love that place. And to see good things like that happen to Murfreesboro and the fans and Middle Tennessee State University brand, uh, it, it means a lot to, to Betty and I for sure. Final question here on the aisle. Coach, you'll be facing another tall guard again in, in Syracuse. Uh, you know, you had success against shutting down Valentine yesterday by putting multiple players, including Perrin Buford, on him. Uh, do you expect that same one through five switching again tomorrow? You know, we'll, we'll do some switching at times, depending on the personnel that Syracuse has in the game. And uh, we'll play our 1-3-1 one, one trapping defense. I think that, that helps slow really good guards down, you know. Uh, 
But it really kind of sometimes matters of kind of personnel in the game where they got to pick and pop four, the different guy that sets the ball screens or switching. So and that's something we'll try to get in our practice today. Okay, Coach, thank you very much. Best of luck. Wisconsin Badgers, student athletes next at 310.
Next session features the Badgers of Wisconsin. They'll have a date with uh, Xavier in tomorrow's second game. Zach Showalter and Ethan Happ are here, and we will go directly to questions, and we're gonna start on the left-hand side, right there. Ethan, uh, Coach Ryan, after your first game, was awfully critical of your footwork and your feet. How much have you improved that since November 13th up to this point? I think it's been um, a big improvement because I, w I was a liability in my team at times. And like you said, Coach Ryan was very critical of me. And um, so to you feel like you lose a, lose a game for your team. And um, after that happens, you just want to improve upon that every day. And I think I've done that. For both of you guys, Wisconsin and Xavier have contrasting styles of play. They're very much up and down where your team is a bit more grinded out. Do you feel that this tomorrow's game is a case where whoever controls the pace controls the game? Zach, you first, please. Then we'll go to Ethan. Yeah, I mean, we want to play at our pace. I think we've done a good job this year um, not, not playing too much out of our style. Uh, so I think that's definitely an advantage to our, to our team. Um, and we want to, we'll probably look forward to do that come tomorrow. Um, I don't, I mean, people say our style of play. I mean, I guess it, throughout the season, like on average, we do play kind of slow. But it's not like we're trying to walk the ball up the court. If we have something available in transition, we're definitely going to take that. And uh, we got to get back on D to stop their transition. Right here. Ethan, you were a red shirt last year, and you sat and watched this team make a run to the national championship. Talk about this experience for you, and does last year motivate you to succeed in this year's tournament? Uh, definitely. Last year, it was just because of how much fun it was um, being with this group of guys and seeing how much success we had. And then, I mean, you take that times two if, if you're actually playing and contributing in it. So um, seeing what the guys did last year, we really wanted to try and emulate that this year. Back on the left. Ethan, you, you talked about working on your feet, but how much did the game experience, how much did experience on the court and games help you in, improve on a daily basis? That's, that's the biggest thing, definitely. You can, I mean, in practice, you can do as much as you would like to, but um, once you get in a game and, you, and then you watch yourself on film and you see the flaws that you have, um, mine were a lot defensively, uh, then I can really you know, watch that over and over again and learn from it and improve. For both of you, again, what are the challenges you see in Xavier? What are your impressions of the team? Zach, lead us off. Uh, they got, they're another, te another team with physical presence inside. Uh, I think we saw it in Pitt last night, but I think this team takes it up to another, to another level. Uh, so we're going to have to stop that, take them out of it, and then they got a lot more shooters. Uh, they got shot makers, and we can't let them get any open looks, and we'll try to do both those things tomorrow night. Uh, they're a solid team. Obviously, they've only lost five games, and for any team to lose five games, regardless of what conference they play in, I mean, they play in a good conference, too, so to only lose five games is, means that they're a good team, and um, we're going to have to play our best ball to beat them. All the way back on the aisle. Zach, you've been one of the leaders on this team. How do you, Hugh and Bronson and Nigel and, and some of the other, Vito as well, how do you guys help lead the team, especially when you're down like yesterday? What do you do specifically to, to help lead this team and, and in general? Yeah, just make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, when shots aren't going in, just make sure people have confidence to keep taking those shots. Um, and then it, it starts on defense, um, just making sure we get stops. And when you get stops, it often leads to transit, some transition buckets we got last night. Um, and then, yeah, just keeping everyone on the same page, like I said. And we'll, 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 it'll work out in our favor in the end. Back to the left. Ethan, that spin move on the block last night in the second half, where, uh, where, did, the, where did those moves come from? How did you, you put that thing together? Um, I mean, I don't want him to see this, but I guess I have to give some credit to Nigel. Just uh, watching him last year, we always go back and forth about who steals who, whose move. Um, and he, he did a great job of helping me uh, mentally throughout this, this year. But I learned a lot from him last year and even his freshman year when I was watching at home. All the way back once again. For both of you guys, what did, you know, a win's a win last night, but what did you learn from last night that can help you tomorrow? Ethan, you first this time. Um, I mean, just regardless of the score, 
or the time, uh, just know that we're always in the game. And I mean, there might be runs for Xavier, or there might be runs for us. Um, regardless, we got to play like it's 0 0 and just keep fighting. Yeah, I think it just showed a lot about our team how far we've come this year. Um, early in the season, I don't know if we would have been able to pull out a win if we didn't shoot the ball that well. Um, so for us to see that we can shoot it as poorly as we did and still come out on the right end of the scoreboard, uh, I think that says about a lot, a lot about our progress this season. Ethan, you talk about never being satisfied, always being motivated, but are you at least happy with the progression that you've made this season from, from where you stood after that Western Illinois loss to where you stand right now heading into the, the Xavier game? I would say I'm, I'm happy with how far I've come, but uh, I still have so much room to improve. And I mean, my coaches tell me that every day. And when I watch it on film, you know, when you think you have a good game, you, you still know on film there's 15 things you could have done better that game. So until I have an actual perfect game, I'll never be satisfied. Ethan, you're not, you live not too far away in Illinois. What have your friends and family said about your success this year and in, uh, in this weekend? Uh, it was great that I got to have some of my AU teammates up and my, uh, my parents and my brother. Um, and they've, they're just really excited in the same sense that I am that this is, this is my first time playing an NCAA tournament. And um, I mean, we've been watching it and filling out brackets since we were little. So to be able to contribute in this um, type of atmosphere, they've, they've been happy for me. And it, I'm just glad they were able to come up and watch. Right down here, Jim. Zach, your your uh, dad and and uh, brother uh, play at, uh, are at Lindenwood. Is that correct? Yes, sir. H have you been able to see them at all this weekend? Get any home cooking, anything like that? Uh, not too much home cooking from dad. That's more of the mom thing. But um, no, yeah, it was good to see them. They're excited that they that we got a regional game that they could get to. Um, it really worked out perfectly for my family. And like I said, they were here last night, so it was good to see them catch up for a little bit. Do you, do you follow their scores at all or anything, or talk to your dad about how that team's going? Yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, I'd call him pretty much after all of our games. He calls me after his games just to check in, um, critique me on some things that I need to pr improve on, uh, and he gives me an update about about how he's doing. So we keep in good contact. Do you see his games? Uh, I, I, unfortunately, I don't watch too many of his games, so I can't see the, the decisions he's making behind the scene. But if I if I knew what was going on, I would definitely have some words uh, words of advice for him. Back here. Thank you. Do you all know any of the Xavier players personally from AAU or just crossing paths before college? No, ma'am. Uh, I do not, but I think some of our Ohio guys have some relationships, but I'm, I, don't quote me on that. <laughs> all the way in the back. Saw some spots of red in the crowd last night. Could you hear them last night, and, and are you looking forward to seeing them again tomorrow? Zach, you first, then Ethan. Yeah, I don't think it was as extreme as playing at the Bradley Center <laughs> a couple of years ago, um, but it had a good feel. I definitely think we had the advantage in that area, um, and whenever you got, I mean, Grateful Red travels so well. Uh, we got fans all around the, all around the country, um, so to have support like that, it says, it says a lot about Wisconsin and the university, and it was awesome last night. Uh, I mean, I said it last night. Um, it kind of felt like a home game just because our fans outnumbered the Pitt fans. And I'm hoping that it's going to be the same way uh, tomorrow. But regardless, I'm just thankful for um, sticking with us this whole year, not just for the postseason, but they've, they've been great all year. Zach, I believe you have three common opponents uh, with Xavier this year, Michigan, Georgetown, and Marquette. Are there anything that, things that you can take away from those opponents or games that can help you prepare, prepare for Xavier tomorrow? Yeah, our coaches did a good job of they already watched all those films um, and got us a scouting report this morning. Um, I can't give you details about what we're going to try to do, but we, we've watched those games. and it's, it's good when you share opponents. I mean, the Big Ten, when you play against teams in the Big Ten, it kind of is relatable to what we're trying to do. Um, so we saw what they're trying to do and what teams have done to take them out of what they're comfortable doing, um, and I think we'll be ready to go. Anything else for the two gentlemen from Wisconsin? Yes, Jim, go. The Big Ten is known for its physical style, and, and as you saw last night, Xavier has 
some big physical guys. Is it playing in the Big Ten? How can that help you for an opponent like this? Zach, lead us off. Yeah, I think one of the similarities um, of teams that kind of kind of plays like Xavier is the is Purdue. Um, they got Haas and Hammond, some seven foot big men um, that we've really we've prepared for a couple times this year and um, got a good look. So I think uh, having that in, as preparation for this game really helps us in that area. Um, yeah, definitely playing in the Big Ten. It doesn't matter where you go. Uh, what teams you play, it's always physical, and um, that's how it was last night, and um, I'm sure that's how it'll be tomorrow. So it's just pretty much the same same style that we're going to keep trying to play with. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. Best of luck tomorrow night. Thank you. Thank you. Coach Greg Gard will be next at 3.30. As advertised, the head coach of the Badgers, Greg Gard, is here. We're going to ask him to make a statement on getting into the second round and the tournament overall. Then we'll go to questions. Greg, please. Thanks. Uh, so I went through the game film from last night. Obviously a, a very physical game that both ways. I think uh, two teams that pride themselves on their defense and 
not making things easy for any offense. And obviously for both of us, it was a, a struggle, but I think it was largely due to the opponent's defense on both ends of the floor, probably as well as we played defensively all year. And then going into tomorrow's game with Xavier, a team that's had a phenomenal year. Chris has done a great job there over the years and um, you know, be a, a similar type game in terms of physicality, uh, the bodies they'll throw at you, how deep they are, how big they are, obviously experienced and talented, and obviously you're not 28 or 29 and four or five or whatever they are, and haven't been in the top uh, five or 10 all year uh, without with not having uh, that much talent. Obviously they do, and they've, he's, um, they've always been very good, and um, we're excited to play them tomorrow. We'll have to play as well uh, defensively and, and even better offensively to uh, play against a very good team. Coach, uh, you and Xavier have uh, contrasting styles. Uh, they get up and down, obviously, a lot. Uh, and you are more grinded out in a lot of your games. How much does pace dictate the tone of the game? And is that a big key tomorrow? Whoever controls the pace would control the momentum. Well, we'd like to get up and down, too. But the problem was the ball wasn't going in for us. So we had to make sure we did the right things in order to have a chance to win the game. So if, if teams allow us to run, uh, we'll do that as well. Uh, but in our league, uh, teams transition very well defensively, and you really have to orchestrate what you do offensively for a, in the half court in terms of a set defense with five guys back. And, and uh, I think our league prepares us for that. And, and really, in order to be successful in the Big Ten, you have to be able to play that way and, and line up and go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Uh, I think any time you get this point in time in the year, um, you know, styles, I mean, each team can control tempo either way. I mean, Xavier has played – in, in a lower possession game, they played in a higher possession game. And we played in lower possession games like last night, and we played in higher possession games when we, you know, our, our second game against Indiana was a higher possession game. Our first game against Michigan State was a higher possession game. So I, I think we've been able to adjust. I don't know if earlier in the year we would be able to win a game like last night and, and be in that type of battle. So our ability and our maturity over the last three months, four months, to be able to morph, so to speak, uh, and adjust to styles and, and adjust basically how the game was being called and what was being allowed or what wasn't being allowed. Uh, from a defensive standpoint, um, we've matured in that regard. And I don't think, like I said earlier in the year, we would have been able to win a 47-43 game or, or been calloused enough and tough enough to be able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with a team like that last night. Over to the left. Uh, Mark Tracy from the New York Times. Uh, Greg, off-topic question, but just watching the game last night, watching uh, the different coaches' styles kind of made me wonder, you don't have any control over it, but in the first half, they're scoring on the basket farther from you, and in the second half, they're scoring on the basket closer to you. As a coach, do you have a preference? Like, not that you have Are a- Are you saying there's a conspiracy theory? No, one, no, no, because everyone has the same. I'm just wondering which you, which you prefer, which no, you I, think I, Wisconsin performs better on, on offense than- No, I've seen us play well in the first half offensively and not as well. And I don't, I don't get into too many theories. I don't try to overthink it or anal analyze it too in depth. I mean, we, I thought we did a better job of finishing in the second half. I thought we got to the rim in the first half, and I won't go into analyzing possession by possession, but we had opportunities in the first half. We got to the ball in the paint. We drove it to the rim. We missed some wide open shots. Uh, the second half, we were able to finish a few more, uh, not, not as an extraordinary amount more, but we were able to make enough shots and then get to the free throw line enough down the stretch. And I think the offensive glass helped us. We were able to extend some possessions and, and uh, get more out of an offensive possession on a couple rebounds and kickouts. Um, but I, I don't try to overanalyze which end we're playing at. Um, sometimes they shoot it better away from me without me yelling at them or saying anything to them on the sideline. I'm back here. Thank you. I don't know if you had a chance to watch Xavier much during the regular season with your own schedule, but now that you've had a chance in the last 24 hours or so to check them out, what do you see as some of the challenges heading into the game against their personnel? Well, they're, they're talented, obviously. Um, Blewett is as good a player as what we've seen all year, very similar to the scores that we've seen in our league. They're big, they're physical, uh, they're, they're deep. They can roll a lot of bodies in there. Uh, they can play, like I said before, at different paces. Uh, they're very good and has al have always been very good defensively. Um, I know Chris is using more of the one-three-one a little bit in, in recent years, and that obviously adds a little different flavor to it at times defensively in terms of what you're preparing for. But uh, I think it's very similar to what we've seen in our league in terms of Michigan State, uh, Purdue, Maryland, 
uh, teams that are big, that are physical, that are very talented. And obviously, you get to this point in time of the year, like I've said before, uh, you have to you have to have something in order to keep advancing. And or you know, and they obviously have a complete package. Um, you know, like I said, I've used all the analytics of them I can. Um, they're they're a handful. I mean, two five men that are that are very good with Reynolds and Farr. Um, you can go on through the list. I can go name by name, but uh, a very talented team that plays very well and they're well coached. And I, there's a reason they're are they 28 and five right now or 29 and five. Okay, 28 and five. You know, it's it's a good team. All the way in the back. Nigel had a tough shooting night last night, but I think I read on Twitter just now that he's not worried about he's not worried about tomorrow. He's he'll be able to bounce back. Is is he one of those guys that you, you never have to worry about that he's always positive? Yeah, I think he's he always sees the cup as half full. You know, I think he's always done that. Um, so I'm not too worried. It, the biggest thing I always try to grade out when I look at the each possession is the quality of the shot. If we're taking higher quality shots, then I'm okay with that. And I understand there's going to be some nights the ball's not going to go in. If you would have told me those two guys were going to be four for 28, I'd say I'm probably not here today, more than likely. But we were able to find a different way to win. And uh, I think that's the mark of a maturing team, that uh, when your better players struggle shooting, that you're able to find a way. Like I mentioned earlier, I don't think had that happened you know, 30, 60 days ago, um, you know, we wouldn't have been able to find a way. So. Fortunately, we were able to and had other guys step up just enough, and uh, Nigel will be fine. I mean, he's he's had rough nights before. Bronson's had rough nights before, and those guys are seasoned players that understand it. It happens. You go with the flow, and you make sure you don't make too big a deal out of it when you go 9 for 10 or whatever he did against um, Michigan State when he had 25 and, and Bronson had 27. You know, we didn't get too rea overreactionary there, and we won't overreact when they, when they struggle a little bit. But it would be nice to – have them, you know, put the ball in the basket. Uh, not that I'm going to say, hey, keep going three for 17. Um, you know, if they can help us out offensively, we'll gladly take it. Over on the left, Greg. I'm going to go for a slightly better question this time. Try for it. Um, Xavier's media people put out a packet that had all the people who uh, made it to the second weekend of the tournament at least five times in the past since like 2008. And if you look at the teams, it's all teams that are you'll see perennially at the top of like the recruiting draft board, the recruiting boards, and then Wisconsin and Xavier. I was wondering if you see any resonances in that, and I certainly you can at least speak for Wisconsin, and you know just how how have you been able to maintain that consistency with different personnel and different seeds even in the tournament? Because it's not just about qualifying for the tournament; it's getting to the second weekend. And Xavier was also on that list. <coughs> Well, obviously, I think I don't. I can't speak for what Chris in terms of internally what his philosophy is, but I think from our standpoint, we're very big on player development. And if you look at the art track record over the years, I mean, I could say that maybe it's not all always in the stars that the recruiting an analysts aren't always right, and and you can't predict how somebody's going to um, boat out in the future or mature. And we've had several. We had the National Player of the Year last year in Frank Kaminsky that was not a highly recruited player. Probably if you looked at recruiting rank rankings, he was probably a two-star, uh, maybe a three in some regards, but a player that developed um, and matured. And I think Chris has had the same type of players over the years. And uh, when you get a system in place and the people in your – and you surround yourself with good people and you work towards that system and, and within that system, you obviously adjust and adapt as your personnel fluctuates. But to be able to maintain that and, and have a way of doing things in a formula for success. And I think obviously he has it there at Xavier. And they've had it there for Z at Xavier a long time. I mean, we played when we were at, uh, when we first got to Wisconsin, uh, Thad Mata was the head coach at Xavier. And we played them then. So uh, we played them when Sean was there. Um, so it's, it's been a program that's maintained consistency. Um, in large part, they've promoted assistance within, um, ironically assistant within that got promoted to um, help maintain the success. But I think once you have that formula in place and understand what works at your university, then you keep you keep st stick to the course and, and stay the process and, and don't deviate from that too much. Don't try to become something that you're not. Um, and for us, that's how we've been able to do it and maintain it. We've had players that uh, I think sometimes have been undervalued and underrated, but they've also been players that have worked extremely hard, paid their dues, 
understood that they were playing for what was on the front of their jersey in the University of Wisconsin and understood that they had to be, at times, had to be patient. Uh, Vito Brown's a great example of a player that, you know, was lightly recruited that now has developed into a pretty good player. Um, you know, we've had others over the years, too, that we've had some stars that have come in and made splashes right away. You know, Sam Decker played right away. Lando Tucker played right away. Devin Harris. So we've had, you know, younger guys come in and, and be marquee contributors, but we've also been able to maintain a constant um, pipeline, so to speak, of, of maturing players and incubating them, so to speak, as they come through their career. And uh, obviously, you, we've been able to have a lot of success with upperclassmen. A lot of our teams have been junior and senior dominated. It's the first time in 15 years we haven't had a junior or a senior starter or a senior in a rotation. So this is a little unique and, a, and such a special tribute for our guys to be able to do it in this manner um, going through the turbulence they've gone through this year and not having uh, any seniors, that, like I said, other than our one walk-on to be in this position is, is pretty uh, exemplary in, in terms of a compliment to those guys and how they've been able to mature faster this year. They've had to grow up in a hurry and they've done a great job of that. Right down here, Jim. <clears throat> yeah, Jim Thomas, St. Louis Post Dispatch. As you know, Zach Showalter's dad coaches at a Division II school here. Are there any advantages getting a player who's a coach's son? Yes. They're, uh, they've grown up around it. Uh, they've uh, they've been in the job. Obviously, Zach's been in the gym since he probably could walk. Uh, Steve was a great player for Coach Ryan at Platteville. He was an All-American in NAIA. So uh, Zach's grown up around it. He understands it. Uh, he knows what it's about. I've always liked Coach's kids. Not not that uh, you know, not to give my own kid any more credit, but hopefully he's he's been around it a little bit more. He understands it. Speaking from my, I got a 12-year-old son that. I think has a pretty good understanding of what the game is about and what goes into it. Um, and I've noticed that over the years of the coaches' kids that I've watched. Um, and I won't go into details on every single one because I'll probably forget one along the way. But uh, it's an advantage. There's no doubt if it's used in the right way. Uh, I think it's definitely it's helped Zach. I know that. I mean, he plays a lot like how his dad played in terms of the toughness. He's four inches shorter, which we were hoping he'd grow four more inches. but. Um, he, uh, he's definitely brought the toughness and the, and the mentality of, uh, I'll do anything to help my team win. And Steve played a lot the same way. We have about seven minutes to go in this session. Next question's on the aisle. Greg, this is your first uh, national tournament as the head coach of Wisconsin. What lessons have you learned from yesterday's game and from this tournament overall that you can build towards uh, to help build this program? I think the, the one thing that I've and it wasn't one that I just learned yesterday, but to stay the course and to not deviate from what your plan is, I think that that helped us be able to uh, turn things around or, or navigate through the rough waters we were facing in mid-December a little faster, that we had a plan in place and we needed to stick to the plan. And even when we started one and four, to not deviate and start to fragment and, and try to change 10 different things. We just need to be better at what we were trying to do and trying to accomplish, and I think that that experience that I've had over the last 25 years has uh, has helped. You know, I, I've watched Coach Ryan navigate through a team maybe that over the course of time that was wobbling a little bit, needed some maturing to happen, and he would never waver from his plan. And I think that was the biggest thing that I've learned and taken forward was that you know know what you do, do what you know, and stick to it, and just work on getting better every day. And that's what this group has done a terrific job of. They've like I said, the turbulence they faced through the year of starting one and four and nine and nine and those things that have been documented where we were at in mid-January, uh, for them to be in this position is a great great tribute to them and how they persevered. They've stuck to it. They didn't flinch. And they kept working and, and believed in each other and grew together. Um, and then, like I said, that's why they're still here. Speaking of Coach, have you talked to him, uh, Bo Ryan, in the last couple of days? Has he given you any words of encouragement? No, it was just a congrats text, keep it rolling. That was it. So. He understood. He told me back in December, hey, you know what you're doing. Go coach the team. I'm going to stay out of your way. If you need any advice, I'll help you whenever I can. But um, he's just stayed in touch through, through text messages, congrats, those type of things. Keep it going. Good luck. All the normal things that about 300 other people have sent me the same text message message in the last 24 hours. So, Anything else for the head coach of Wisconsin? Oh, in the back. 
Coach, between getting your first tournament win, scouting Xavier, getting the practice plan today, you getting any sleep? You getting time to enjoy this? Uh, I think any time, you know, this year probably has been a little more for me in terms of analyzing video, uh, more in depth than even as an assistant because I've looked at not only the opponent upcoming, but also dove into our practices and really tried to break down what we were doing and try to make sure we were doing the right thing. So I'm used to no sleep at this time of year. It's a good problem to have. You know, it beats laying on a beach somewhere on spring break. I'd rather be up all night watching film and getting ready for what's next. That means that's a good problem to have. If you're sleep deprived as a college coach this time of year, thumbs up. You're still, you're still dancing. Standing up way in the back. Coach, how much pressure do you put on yourself, and has that changed since you've gotten the head coaching job? I haven't really ever looked at this as being pressure. I, I've never felt that. I've just tried to work every day to help our team have the best experience possible. And that's how we've been able to accomplish what they've accomplished this year, to stay in the moment, uh, not try to get too far down the road, understanding that the most important day was today. And, and you can rewind that for the last you know, 100 days or 115 or whatever it's been since that, that time when I took over. And um, we've, just, we've really lived in the moment and just tried to make sure we were improving every day, focusing on what was important, what things that were within our control. And um, as long as we did that, which our guys, like I mentioned before, have done a phenomenal job of staying, staying focused and locked in on what we wanted to work on each and every day, um, they, they believed in the process. And I've talked a lot about the process over the last three months of not worrying about the end result or the scoreboard, just focusing on the task at hand on that specific day. Um, we would eventually be in a pretty good position, which obviously has happened. So I, 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 don't allow, excuse me, I don't allow myself to really look down the road and play the games of what if or, or where we're at. It's just a matter of practicing well here today, preparing for Xavier tomorrow, and uh, going to try out and try to play as, as well as possible tomorrow night. Anything else for the head coach, uh, the Badgers? All right, thank you very much. All right, Best thank of you. luck tomorrow. Xavier, student athletes up next at 355.
J.P. Mercura, Miles Davis, Edmund Sumner, and James Farr represent the Xavier Musketeers in this session, 20 minutes long, and we will start right off with questions. The first one being right there. Miles, uh, Xavier and Wisconsin have contrasting styles of play, largely. Um, you know, you guys want to get up and down, and, and they're more grinded out, especially in the last game, of course. Do you think that um, pace is a big um, indicator of who will control the momentum in this game, and how important do you think is pace just in general in a game like this? Um, I, I think uh, pace does play a role. You know, uh, Wisconsin does like to slow the ball down. Uh, we have uh, a good certain pace that we uh, that we go with, but I mean, honestly, it really doesn't matter as long as you know whichever offense is clicking the best. And you know, we try not to even pay attention to our offense or the pace. You know, it's all about getting stops, regardless if we're scoring 10 points or if we're scoring 50 points. So, you know, it doesn't matter. But uh, pace pace will probably play a good role here. Right back. JP, you guys have a few opponents in common, um, Marquette, Georgetown, Michigan. Does seeing them play those teams um, prepare you in any way heading into tomorrow's game? I mean, it, it more prepares the coaches because they can watch those games and, and give us more details on how to defend them, how to execute on offense. Edmund, this is your first NCAA tournament, uh, you know, as an active player. What's it like for you kind of coming onto this stage for the first time? Do you ask other guys for advice or lean on anyone, just knowing it's a little different than the Big East tournament or the regular season? Uh, I mean, most of the older guys, they just paved the way for me, you know, just letting me know just to keep doing what I've been doing throughout the whole season and not to change anything. Stay there, yes. <laughs> James, uh, I know it's been kind of a crash course, and I don't know how much you even really know about the X's and O's of Wisconsin at this point, but what do you see as some of the challenges uh, in tomorrow's game? Um, you know, we haven't really discussed Wisconsin that, that much. Um, we'll do that later on tonight and today in practice. But, um, we just know that they're a big physical team. Uh, they rebound, they go through their post players, and they have some, some key shooters. Uh, that's all we really know for now. You guys are notoriously a good free throw shooting team, but yesterday you guys only got to the line maybe four times. Is that something you guys plan to do, be more aggressive getting to the, to the, to the hoop and going to the foul line? Miles first, then James. <clears throat> um, yeah, yesterday we didn't get to the free throw line too much, but you know, it's okay. We're going to try uh, again tomorrow, like like you said, to try to be more aggressive and to use that aspect of the game to, you know, help us be better. So, I mean, we'll, we'll get to the line tomorrow and then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll make our free throws. Um, yeah, I don't think we weren't being aggressive yesterday, you know. Um, that wasn't the case. It was just the way Weber State um, defends as well. They're a team that really doesn't aggressively hedge on ball screens. You know, they kind of back up, so they don't really foul much. And, um, you know, we went to the line four times, but that didn't depict how we played. And I thought we played very well yesterday. For any of you guys, I know that uh, you've been working on not settling for shots and not just taking quick shots. How do you feel like your sele shot selection was yesterday? Edmund first and JP. Uh, I think we did pretty well. A couple possessions, we, we shot the ball kind of fast, but uh, with the older guys, we kind of settled down. I knew we had to get some great shots because we went 0 for 2 a couple times up the floor. So I think our side selection was pretty good last game. Um, I would say it's pretty good as well. Um, throughout the whole year, I think we've all been playing for each other and passing the ball, making extra passes. And I think that's a, a key reason why we've been so successful this year. I'm right back here. Thank you. A little bit of light note. Miles, do you ever get tired of the constant Billy Madison references? <laughs> I mean, I feel like everybody says that nowadays, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny now, but I like the more creative ones when people come up with. Do you guys have a creative uh, Miles Davis reference? No. <laughs> no. Not that I know of. No. Not at all. <laughs> Wow. 
stay right there. Thank you. James, you've talked a couple times this year about uh, the defense down the stretch being wavy or inconsistent. After last night's performance, do you feel like that was a, a confidence booster for you guys going forward to be able to, to play the way you did? Uh, yeah, of course. You know, um, no, Weber State's a, a very good team. Um, you know, they won their conference. You know, they have two good players over there. And, um, you know, to see how Remy defended uh, Jeremy Singlin. And, uh, you know, Jeremy Ballenboy is going to be an NBA player probably. And, uh, you know, and we kind of contained him as well. So, you know, that's very uh, a big confidence booster. And we just hopefully we can build off of that. Anything else for the gentleman from Xavier? All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Best thank you. of luck tomorrow. Head coach Chris Mack will be up at 415.
Head coach of the Musketeers is with us, Chris Mack. We're going to ask him to make a statement about getting into the second round, maybe about the tournament in general, and then we'll go to questions. Chris, please. Well, anytime you can advance um, in tournament play, you know, you count your blessings. We, um, we played particularly well, I thought, in the last eight minutes of the game. And, you know, our rebounding against Weber State was, was really good from, from start to finish. So we have a tough opponent on our hands, a team that's battle tested, a team with um, veterans from a year ago in their championship game run. And so we, we know what we're up against, and we have to be up to the challenge. <clears throat> Start down here on the left. Hey, Chris. Uh, James Farr looked, seemed like kind of a project for you guys when he first got there. And I was wondering if you could talk about his kind of development to this point, especially now he's become almost kind of a go-to scorer. Yeah, it's been incredible. You know, I, I don't know if people that don't follow our program very closely can appreciate uh, how far he's come. You know, when, when he first arrived at Xavier, he, he tied everything into – how he shot the ball from the three-point line. You know, he fancied himself as a pick-and-pop jump shooter. And if that wasn't falling, he just sort of hung his head. And whether it's how terrific of a rebounder he's become at both ends of the floor, uh, his ability to score in the low post. Uh, even a year ago, he wasn't very comfortable uh, scoring with his back to the basket. And, um, you know, we just asked him to sort of check himself and figure, you know, figure out ways where he could be effective around the basket. And he worked night and day with Mike Geese, our assistant coach. And I think he got a lot of confidence in our first uh, scrimmage, our first and only scrimmage against Illinois early in the year. Uh, they have Mike Thorne, who's a terrific fifth-year guy. And you know, James scored, I think, on back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back, uh, possessions in that scrimmage and you know, at a time where the scrimmage was sort of nip and tuck. And I, I think from that point forward, he really – felt like he could score in the low block. And I just have seen his confidence grow and grow and grow. And he's sort of taking that jump shot and putting it uh, and has put it deep in his back pocket. And really, our, our team has benefited because of his ability to rebound, score in the low post, and just be a presence underneath. Next question is on the aisle. Coach, how much does pace um, matter in a game like tomorrow's game, where you guys obviously play uh, up and down? and as indicated by their last game, they're more grinded out. Yeah, hopefully that plays into our big guys' hands because from what I understand, they're really slow. So if, since the pace is going to be is what it is, uh, we're just going to have to play that way. Um, you know, you try to speed teams up. You know, Wisconsin isn't as slow as one may think. They're going to be opportunistic in transition. Um, but it's a basketball game. Whether there's 30 possessions or 70 possessions, we have to put the ball in the basket more than they do. Stay there, and then we're here. What have the last 12 hours been like for you in terms of just kind of regrouping and starting to study Wisconsin and getting the team kind of ready for the next game? A little hectic. Um, but I have a great coaching staff. Um, you know, our assistant coaches, uh, probably like every other team in the tournament, have done advanced scouting. Uh, so really had a, a Cliff's Notes version of what Wisconsin or Pittsburgh presented. And, so we, uh, we met in my room last night, uh, watched film uh, for a couple hours, and then um, started back up this morning and then started to feed some of that information to our players around breakfast time. Chris, do you know uh, Greg Gard at all? Do you think kind of an appreciation for the job he's done, oh, taking he's done over a, for Coach Ryan? He's done a terrific job. and I don't know, have to know Greg that well to, to see that. You know, and I know that. A lot was made of all the pieces that Wisconsin lost from a year ago, and they didn't have necessarily the non-conference start that Badger fans were probably used to or even expecting because of so much success that, that Coach Ryan's had. But it's been really impressive to see the growth of this year's team uh, with, with some younger players. Uh, you know, obviously, Greg earning the job before the season was over says a lot about the job he did. You know, so from afar, you know, I'm happy because any time, you know, you have an assistant coach in a program that has dedicated their entire professional life, um, you know, for, for that program, I mean, he's been there for such a long time, um, it's really good to see. Because a lot of times assistant coaches, all they need is a shot. They just need a chance. 
And a lot of times what keeps him back is that experience. You know, it's hard. If you don't get a shot, how do you get experience? So I'm really happy for him. Obviously a big time job, uh, but he's, he's proven so far that he's certainly uh, more than able. Right here in front, Chris. Chris, are, are there programs that you have modeled yours after? I mean, we're talking about Wisconsin. They've obviously had a long run of success, depending. You know, the new guy steps in, he just kind of keeps it going. Are, are there programs in the country that you have looked at and said, this is how kind of we want to do things? Um, you know, I say on the defensive side of the ball, um, you know, years ago, we decided to um, implement more of a pack line system. There are some wrinkles between, you know, what uh, Wisconsin traditionally did under Coach Bennett, uh, what Tony Bennett does at Virginia, and maybe what we do um, at Xavier. But, you know, I, I think as a coach, you're a little bit of everybody you come across that um, you either work with or play for. There's not necessarily a program that we model ourselves after, I wouldn't say, but um, you know we're all stealers, so to speak, in this business, and we steal little things from one another. Down here. Coach, a general question for you. I don't know how many other scores you look at over the weekend, but any, any thoughts on why there seems to be so many upsets this year? I think there's upsets every year. You know, I think maybe that the gap, um, you know, between 2 and 15, 3 and 14, um, maybe isn't as drastic as it once was. There are a lot of one and duns. Um, you know, I think also you have college players now that for years, because of AAU basketball, have competed against one another since they were in third grade all the way up to uh, entering college. A lot of these guys at this stage know one another. You know, there are, there are a lot of players that, you know, in my locker room when we go over another team's scouting report, you know, I'll look out there and say, well, Miles Davis, you know, he played um, with Derek Gordon at Seton Hall, for instance. You know, he played against Isaiah Whitehead. And it's like all these kids uh, who have become young men know one another and grow up against one another. And, you know, the more familiar, familiarity you have, the more often that you've played against um, players around the country, um, the, the more you know you belong. It's like when you play basketball with your older brother growing up. You know, you, you, you can beat your older brother. I mean, it's, he's your older brother. You know, you just punch him in the stomach a couple times, so you're used to him. Right here. Coach, Xavier fans were out here. I'm yesterday. sorry? Xavier fans were out no, here yesterday. No, 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 no. Xavier. Xavier. Excuse Xavier, me. yes. Xavier. Just like xylophone. Just like, just like xylophone. Yes. Xavier fans are out the here yesterday. Out. <laughs> but uh, there was definitely a sea of red when uh, Wisconsin was playing. Uh, do you guys plan to uh, treat this game like a road game? And how do you plan to counteract uh, what could be a very pro-Wisconsin crowd? We can't worry about the crowd. I mean, I don't know how we would counteract it anyway other than, um, you know, stopping them from coming in the building somehow. So, um, you know, our contingent will be very loud. You know, I think we'll have more fans on a Sunday than maybe a Friday. But, um, you know, we're, we're going to – business as usual. You know, we just got to get off to a good start, uh, play our brand of basketball, and not worry about the crowd. We've been pretty good on the road all year. Coach, uh, Nigel Hayes didn't have maybe a, a game yesterday that's indicative of how he's been all season. But can you speak about him and maybe some of the other challenges that Wisconsin presents? Well, first of all, he's very experienced. You know, they use, they've utilized him a little bit more at the three this year as opposed to the four a year ago. Uh, but it hasn't made him any less effective. They certainly at times will play him at the four. Um, in their offense, they have multiple players that will post. He's a terrific passer. Uh, besides his passing ability, his ability to draw fouls concerns us. Uh, so we have to do a great job of defending him, both on the perimeter and the post without fouling. His shooting performance yesterday was probably one he'd like to forget, but you know you are who who you are on the back the back of your baseball card. We know what his percentage is. We know that the amount of times he shoots the, uh, shoots the ball from the three point line and gets to the foul line. So he's a big challenge. You know he's an All Big Ten performer. Uh, we understand that. And then, you know Ethan Happ is a guy that maybe not a lot of people knew about coming into the year because he redshirted. Big Ten Freshman of the Year. He's got incredible footwork uh, for such a young player at this level. He go right hand, left hand. Um, he has a great feel for how to use his body. 
in his positioning. So he's a challenge. And then again, um, when you play against a Big Ten opponent, you're not going to have stiffs at the two guard, the small forward. You're going to go against players that are very, very high caliber, high quality. And uh, again, a really uh, disciplined system, a disciplined style of play on both ends of the floor. Anything else for the head coach? All right. Thank you very Thank much. You. Best of luck tomorrow. Thank you. First tip is at 510, Middle Tennessee State and Syracuse, followed by Wisconsin and Xavier. Thank you, everyone.